You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Hey everybody, what is going on? This is another episode of the Dave Bullis Podcast. Uh, so in this episode, we're going to be talking a lot about networking. Um, and the one thing I want to mention, and this is just something that's been on my mind recently, is the amount of friend requests I get on Facebook. Uh, I don't really do anything on Facebook, but I get a ton of requests on there. Uh, I usually get about a request a day. And I always hit accept. Um, most people do not say a single word. They don't message me or anything, and the other half seem to just immediately uh, start sending me invitations to like their pages. So does either one of these things work? Uh, and the answer is no. Um, you know, it's just kind of like dating. You, you, you don't want to appear too desperate. You don't want to appear uh, – you want to build a relationship. you got to start a conversation, something. Um, and trust me, I know a, a lot about desperation <laughs> and starting conversations. Uh, so, so when I see these people send me these requests and they don't do anything or they send me an invitation right off the bat to go like their page, it just means that you're out to get something from me. And it just means that you don't really care about me or whatever. You're just trying to get me another like or maybe you're trying to just rump your friend count. Um, don't do that, people. Like, like, go out there, and I, I mean, I'll give you another example. I have a guy on Twitter who messages me all the time asking me to donate to his campaigns, and I will not donate a single freaking dollar to his campaigns because they're all – he's been doing it for a while. There's no – care about who I am. I'm just a dollar sign and he's just trying to get money off of me. I, I don't understand why people would donate to something like that. But then again, I mean, you know, I'm not exactly the most successful person, so maybe I'm doing a lot wrong. But this week's uh, guest, he is definitely doing something right. So in this week's episode, the, per, the my guest is a producer of the Summer of 84 um, and is currently producing the upcoming series Julie and the Phantoms, which is set to release in 2020. Uh, he's a development a director uh, at Bright Light Pictures. Without further ado, this is episode 234 with guest Jameson Parker. I started as an actor. I, I spent a lot of time as a kid wanting to be an actor and was in theater through high school. And I went to school for it. I went to, to college for it um, up here in Vancouver, um, did a, a big conservatory theater program at the University of British Columbia. I worked for a long time in professional theater in Canada. Um, well, I guess a couple of five, six years old long time um and then wanted to start making my own work and uh and thought you know if i'm gonna do this if i'm gonna like produce my own work i want to learn how to do it properly so um you know started putting a few things together met sean williamson who runs bright light and um just to ask him hey look how do you how have you been doing it? You've been doing it for a long time. How do I get to where you are? And he took me under his wing and showed me how to produce properly and, and gave me the, um, the tools to go out and find material and start producing stuff for bright light. And, uh, the rest just kind of took off and all of us, all of a sudden I'm here, uh, you know, with a couple movies under my belt and excited for more and a couple things on the horizon and working on my first TV show now. So it's, um, it's been, it's been an incredible ride with bright light over the past. I've been with them now for five years. So do you, do you think that's still, you know, that, that still happens? It's almost like an apprenticeship, you know, when you when you're able to approach Sean, you know, uh, you know, a lot of the, the, you know, when you, the internships you hear about, they don't really kind of lead <laughs> anywhere. Do, do you think you kind of like, you know, almost struck gold by, by forming that relationship and you just kind of were in the right place at the right time? I think so, man. I, I think that there, um, I think there's a lot of people who still believe, um, in that kind of formation, the apprenticeship kind of formation. I think that, um, uh, they're few and farther between. And, you know, there are a lot of, internship opportunities out there, especially in LA that don't lead to anything. Um, my, the way that I came to bright light was a little unconventional, but I, I do think that I did luck out by 
meeting Sean and, and, uh, um, and him taking me under his wing here. But then, you know, I saw the opportunity and, um, jumped on it. And there's been a few people who have been given this same opportunity here at the company that I've seen falter and, um, you know, not make the most of it. So I think it's a little bit like I got lucky, but also really wanted to capitalize on what was given to me. And so, um, yeah, it's tough. It's tough to form those relationships that are actually meaningful and somebody who genuinely cares about <clears throat> bringing up um, young producers and writers and directors um, and has the ability to do so. You know, usually those people who can make a real difference in your life are so hard to get a hold of and so hard to pin down in their time. Um I was pretty relentless with Sean. So in the beginning, just kind of knocking on his door and knocking on his door. And eventually he had to, uh, had to schedule a coffee with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's kind of like the catch 22, you know, usually the people you want to meet, uh, are too busy actually making things. And the reason you want to uh, yeah. meet them is because they're actually making things. Yeah. And I think, you know, you kind of have to look, um, I've been asked that question a lot. Like, how do I, you know, how do I break in? How do I find those people? And it's like, well, look at your, um, look at your, the people in your life in your circle of influence and, and see what the six degrees of separation are to somebody, make it personal, um, and try and work those roots. I, I met Sean because his son, went to the same high school as I did, but years after me. Um, and one of my old teachers was like, Hey, I know you're doing this. Would you like to meet Sean? And I said, I would love to. And so I kind of lucked out that way. Um, but it's been the same with other mentors in my life. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Todd Black, uh, Todd runs a company called escape artists and they do, you know, they did the upside and the equalizer movies. And, and he's been an incredibly successful, uh, producer, for many, many years. And I was introduced to Todd through a friend and just kind of the same thing. Um, you should meet this person. And Todd has been incredibly generous with his time. And, um, it's been a very, very cool, uh, working relationship. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think it's, there are opportunities out there. You just kind of have to really dig to seek them out sometimes. Yeah, yeah, that, that's very true. And, and, you know, you mentioned breaking in, um, which, you know, I, I was – which is in my notes to talk about. But, you know, since you actually brought it up, you know, what, what advice do you have for breaking in? Because you hear all these – you know, there's a lot of different theories or recommendations or advice that you hear out there about how to break in. Um, some people say do it with a spec script. Some people say do it with a, making a short film. Um, some people say maybe even start with an apprenticeship as the the old way was kind of like that. So so what do you, what do you feel on that, Jameson? Um, I mean, look, I, I think it's, it's, a uh, there's a lot of advice out there because there's a million different ways that you can do it. And <clears throat> I think what really helps is self-awareness and figuring out, okay, this is what I want to do. This is where I want to be. Um, and these are the tools at my disposal. You know, some people won't be uh, as lucky and won't have, um, you know, one or two degrees of separation from somebody who will give them the time. And then I think you need to work on your craft, hone your craft, um, go out and, and also go out and meet those people, but not in a, um, like it, very obviously networky way. I'm so opposed to that word. I need to go and network. Um, because it's not about networking. It's about forming real human relationships with people and finding things that you have in common. And that may be film, you know, it may be film, it may not, but, um, creating real relationships with people and, um, understanding what your point of view is like the number one thing I think to break in. There's just a lot of white noise out there. And then I always go back to the Duplass brothers, always go back to the Duplass brothers, Mark and Jay, who, would always say, um, just keep making shit, just keep making shit. The cavalry isn't coming. The cavalry isn't coming. Um, and they, they were like the first, uh, short films that you make will be terrible. And then you'll make a few that are just a little less terrible and then they get less and less terrible until it's something passable. So keep, you know, it's, it, there's an element of perseverance, uh, 
that kind of permeates everybody's story. There's every success story. There is this, um, yeah, this element of perseverance and, and banging your head against the wall until the brick cracks. You know, it is, I feel that a lot too. So, so Jameson, you know, you mentioned networking, you know, do you ever go to any of these networking events? Cause I'm sure you get invited to like 10,000 events, a, you know, a month. Is there, do you ever go to any of these events and you just kind of feel that, you know, maybe sometimes these aren't the best approach to this? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, I get invited to a few. I mean, Vancouver's community is a lot smaller than Los Angeles. When I, when I'm in LA, like I split my time between, between Vancouver and Los Angeles. When I'm in LA, there's a lot of invites and there's a lot of these things. And I think it's about choosing the right ones when you get to a certain point. Like there is a value there for sure to just to be around people and to meet people. But, um, I actually, I actually have a great success story from from these networking events. Where there's one in, in Los Angeles called the Little Black Book event, and um, I think it's phenomenal. Lots of lots of junior executives, people at great companies who are doing cool things, who are, you know, really really hungry and passionate, uh, go to this event. <clears throat> and I was taken to it by another producer at Bright Light, like um, three maybe more years ago. And that is actually where I met first met Matt Leslie, who wrote summer of 84, where he first pitched me summer was at one of these networking events. And so I have a really great relationship with them. Um, and, you know, have seen direct success come out of it. So I do believe in spending your time, your, your, which is your capital, spending your time on doing these things, going to South by Southwest, going to Cannes, going to Toronto if you can, and going to these festivals and meeting people and swapping ideas and stories. And, um, yeah, I think that there's a great advantage to them, being a part of a community. Well, you know, that that's fantastic. You were able to actually meet the writer of Summer of 84 there. So, you know, what, what are some of the, you know, kind of like what, what what did he do that was actually you know right or just kind of what did he do that just didn't seem you know you know what i mean when you go to a lot of these network events some people just scream desperation and then if yes. you, and then if you're really unlucky you meet somebody like me there and you're like oh god i'm never going to these things again but um <laughs> <laughs> but uh but you know when you see all these people there and some of these people are just so just like i mean they're they're just ready to latch on to anybody for anything you're like whoa well, you know what I mean? It's so, so yeah. w w what was the way that you were approached, you know, that, that was actually where, where you were like, you know what? I actually want to hear this pitch. Um, Matt is real. Matt is a really down to earth guy. Um, and, and we just spoke in a very human way. We just kind of, um, and, and that's kind of what I love. Like it's not so focused. I get out of this interaction, you know, and it's less about having a real human connection than it is about what can I, what kind of transactional uh, piece can I pull from this person? Um, and, you know, Matt is, was, uh, and always will be a very engaging person who is super passionate about his work. Um, but has a, he does have a confidence to him that you go, this isn't off putting at all, which is great. And so that was, you know, we had a, a real, um, a real conversation and you can kind of tell, okay, this is a guy that, you know, not only do I want to read his script, but I also want to, um, hang out with him more. And Matt and I have become great friends over the years. Um, am such a big, big fan of his. Um, so it's, um, I don't know. It was something very, just normal about it and less transactional, which is what really turns people off. So did, did, did some of the, the advice that like Sean gave you help to kind of like, de, de, you know, kind of decipher some of that meaning, you know, when you're, you're listening to a pitch, you know, is this idea fully realized? Can you envision this in your head? Uh, you know, can you see the poster? Uh, you know, would this be even marketable, you know, uh, and not only here in America, but, you know, overseas and stuff like that. Is that some of the things that went through your head when you're hearing the pitch? Um, honestly, it was just a movie that I wanted to see. I wanted to see a lot of those things like, you know, 
can you see the poster? Can you see the trailer? Is it going to do well overseas? Like that is, those are notes from studio execs and, um, and it's it's tough because we don't you know we don't have a marketing department here we don't have um, a distribution arm we don't have a foreign sales arm here so yes we have an understanding of the market and kind of uh, hope that we fit within that but I mean my philosophy has always been more about what movies I want to make rather than what movies the market wants to see. I, I kind of feel like if you chase that, if you chase what's doing well in the marketplace, you're always going to be behind the eight ball. You know what I mean? Like, um, and you get things like Gemini man and you get things like, um, fuck, what was the big ball oh, Terminator dark fate that bombs at the box office. And you know, you're, you're responding more to a market than to, um, a great story or, um, a really cool, uh, piece of acting and, and casting in something. And so when he pitched me summer, it was, I could see the movie. I understood what it was. And I grew up loving those films that he referenced the Goonies, um, stand by me, Disturbia rear window was a big one was a big influence for us. And for them on the script, like, um, but it was really when he sent me the lookbook that I was like, Oh shit, this, I have to, I have to read this script immediately. That was, that was a big one for that movie that I was like, this is really cool. Yeah. You know, when you see these movies that come out like Gemini, man, you mentioned Terminator, you know, it it seems to be that that's what the studios are always chasing. Uh, It's either the big superhero movie or it's a reboot remake of, you know, a a piece of the series, you know what I mean? Like a series that, you know, what can come out. That's why you know I, I've always been trying to gravitate towards seeing original films now because yeah. you know it's 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 weird to say this, Jameson, but and s- sometimes it's harder to actually get to see those movies because they don't, maybe don't have a, a release on like Netflix or something like that, um, and they're certainly not going to be in the theater because they're you know there's superhero movies and reboots in there, so it's it, you know you have to really start to kind of be on the look for those types of things. You really do, and. Um, I just feel like people are starting to get tired of the reboot of the reboot. I mean, I know that I am. I'm also like you and I are a different class of filmmaker, different, uh, not class, I guess is the wrong word, but a different type of film watcher. Like we uh, spend our lives talking about movies and seeking things out. Um, it is too bad that all that is out there now are franchises and reboots and, you know, something based on IP that there's a, you have to really, really seek out cinema that is original and interesting. Um, and then there's things that break through like Jojo rabbit. And, um, I mean, even some of the Tarantino stuff is, is auteur cinema is like, really great original cinema but it is drawn it is driven sorry by a star it is driven by some kind of narrative (coughs) um so uh yeah i wish that there was more of an appetite for some of those uh, original stories tv is where it's at though right now that's where people are putting all of those stories right right And, and you know that's where you see stuff like breaking bad and uh you know, you get to see all the like Game of Thrones and all. Well, even though that's a, an existing property, maybe that's a bad example. But yeah. but you know what I mean? It's still. No, no, it's, no. But like Succession, I'm watching Succession right now, or um, C on Apple TV, or um, what else? I mean, like you said, Breaking Bad, Mad Men, all the great examples of television, right? Like, um, yeah, there's a. TV is where original stories are being told right now. So, so what are some of your favorite TV shows in the past couple of years have you seen? I spent a lot of my time watching movies because we typically develop films. But um, uh, the stuff that I have watched that I have loved, like I am in the middle of succession now and really, really love it. Um, uh, Mad Men is actually is probably one of my – all time favorites. There is just something I love about, uh, those kind of corporate dramas. Um, 
and I've always been fascinated by advertising. I've realized that Mad Men is a, um, a very stylized, fictionalized version of um, uh, of the ad agency world, but it's still endlessly fascinating to me. Um, and then we got to work with uh, Rich Summer on Summer of 84, which was really cool and, and really fun. And, um, what else have I watched that I've loved? Like, oh, uh, um, actually, both of Phoebe Waller Bridges shows Crashing and, um, oh my God, what? Uh, I'm blanking right now. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not even familiar with it, so I don't know. Uh, it'll come to me. It's just one. I'm just having a brain fart right now. Um, a lot of Sherlock I loved. Like, there is, there's just a lot of great TV. So when you know you, you mentioned that you know you do do a lot of work with movies primarily, uh, you, you know, and we were talking about original you know stories, and you know finding those original screenplays. So, Jameson, kind of take me through like how you find like a piece of material, and then how you go about you know kind of developing that piece of material. Fleabag, Fleabag is the name of the show. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I, thought that, I thought that was your answer. I was like, I don't, I don't know what he's talking about. You're like, I don't know what he's talking about. How do I find a piece? Of, I mean, look, it's tough. It is like it's like gold mining, really. Um, it's like gold mining, except the version of gold that you're looking for changes for each person who's looking for it. It's it's very weird. Like you have to sift through a lot of rock and mud and dirt to get to something that you want to spend time with. Um, and it's about, you know, it's about finding a germ of an idea in something. It's about finding um, something worth spending time on um, and something that is really engaging. Um, at least that's what it is for me because you, then you're going to end up spending so much time with it on rewrites and having to pitch the thing to a million different people first to bring directors on, or maybe another writer to come and do a rewrite. And then it's actors and financiers and you're always talking to agents and managers and you have to have this, passion for that project that um is unrelenting or it's going to become such a slog because you spend so much time with these pieces of material so um yeah it's about finding something you love and then also i mean on top of that it's about finding people that you like working with i mentioned how much i liked working with um matt and steve on summer of 84 but rkss too who directed the film are just such great. I mean, they're fun filmmakers. They put a lot of their really uh, phenomenal energy up on screen and they um, are just so, so great to work with that I've got two more projects with them because I enjoy what they enjoy. We um, have a great kind of back and forth and understanding of each other as filmmakers and um I want to help develop their voice and and take it out into the marketplace. So you know, it just you know, with knowing all of that, you know, when you do like actually go out there and to to find material, I mean, do do you get materials like like you know maybe submitted to you like hey the script was on the blacklist or hey the script was uh, you know rated by Script Shark or this script was on the uh, on the uh, was a finalist for the Nicole Fellowship? Is that one of the other ways you, you find screenplays? Yeah, I mean, uh, there are um, agents and, and managers who I um, who I appreciate their taste and have a good relationship with. I get stuff from them. I get stuff from um, actors and writers and directors that that I know or that you know Brightlight knows that we work with. Um, I'm also going out and kind of mining some of the things that. Uh, I love whether it's um, books or plays or articles that um, I think would make great films and finding, you know, something that we can start to build out. Um, so it, it really comes in a, in a lot of different forms. Sometimes we get things, Sean gets things sent to him by 
um, directors that he's worked with in the past or writers that he's worked with in the past and wants to to work with them or see if there's something in a script that they've sent to him. So it comes to us in a lot of different forms for sure. But there is always some kind of um, vetting process before it gets to before it gets to, to me or Sean or um, anybody else at Bright Light for sure. Yeah, and and you know, you again, like we were talking about with the networking, you you always have to have some kind of uh, vetting process for a whole number of reasons. But uh, you, you know, you always want to make sure that relationship. Again, like you said, it's not going to be like a transaction or you know, what are you doing for me right now? Yeah, yeah, it's always going to be, um, hopefully, a genuine interaction. Right, right. And then, you know, and you want to be able to build on that and you want to be able to keep going, you know, and make like, you know, two, three, four, five, six movies, you know, and, and just keep growing and building together, right? That is, that would be the ideal for sure. Um, it doesn't always work out that way. I mean, not everybody works well together, but um, it, that is the ideal, you know, to be able to work with the same people that you enjoy working with time and time again. So, you know, just to kind of continue with that question, uh, uh, Jameson, you know, have, have you ever seen like some someone's like YouTube short film and, and, and become interested in, you know, maybe like working with that person? The reason I ask is because, you know, you, you kind of um, if you look at like uh, what was that movie? Um, Kung Fury uh, that yeah. movie came out or even the guy who did uh, Too Many Cooks. Uh, I mean, he, he was able to get, you know, uh, some traction on that. Um, then you see like the other the um, I forget what his name is. I think it's if is the guy who did the Evil Dead remake. Um, is it Alvarez? I think his name is. Oh, uh, um, uh, uh, yes, Fetty Alvarez. Yes, and then uh, so he did Panic Attack, and then he was able to make you know Evil Dead. Um, do, do you see? You know, do you ever actually you know maybe go on YouTube or anybody you know at Bright Light ever you know look at what anyone's doing in that sort of realm? Uh, you know, on like YouTube or or you know uh, Vimeo or anything like that. I'm sent stuff for sure. Uh, there's I'm sent stuff. Um, it's tough because YouTube is such has such a glut of material on there that. Um, it's if I if I spent any amount of time on it, if I spent any amount of time that would actually yield results, I would be only doing that. Like there's just not enough hours in the day. Um, so, but I am sent stuff like people are like, hey, what do you think about this director? What do you think about this short film? And there was like I can point to one in particular. There's a, a filmmaker by the name of Brian Petzos, and Brian's made a couple of short films. One was called Tiki Tacky, and one was called Lightning Face. Um, and my friend Greg Loritano, another producer, sent me his material and was like, hey, I'm trying to put together this guy's feature. Would you be interested in helping? And immediately you could see that this guy had a style. He had a point of view. He um, was an incredibly deft filmmaker, and so it was definitely something that I wanted to be involved in. Um, I didn't end up being on the feature with them, but I did. I was, you know, really, really excited about this filmmaker, and it ended up getting made, which was great. Um, so I'm excited to see the film, and still talk to Brian and and Greg about the movie regularly, which is awesome. Yeah, because you know, the reason I brought that up was just because that's kind of the the medium kind of lends itself towards filmmakers as more and more people have, have gotten gotten have gotten on there. But like you pointed out, you know, there's a gluttony on there, and two, you know, things can't be you know monetized anymore if they if they're you know YouTube is you know uh, uh, censorship has gotten like really really out of hand. Uh, I mean, hell, I'm I'm even demonetized, <laughs> and so. Yeah. So like I, I, uh, you know, it, so basically it's, it, it's like you have to be very, you know, super cl uh, squeaky clean and no violence. So it's kind of hard if they're, if they're hoping to get any, you know, monetization from views on, on that side of it. But, uh, on the flip side, it, you know, it can gain some exposure for people like David F. Sandberg is another example. He actually started on, on YouTube and then he made the uh, lights out. Yeah. I mean, look, it is, it's, it's more about, I think it's less about YouTube, more about people who, um, are just making material. Like that is the, that is the kind of, um, thread between all of these people is that they're just, they're making shit, right? They're, they're out there and they're actually getting their hands 
dirty um, and doing things. Uh, and that, you know, whether they shone, shone through on YouTube or because they just sent a private link to somebody, um, they, they're out there making things and refining what they like and figuring out what they want to do behind the camera. It's, um, I think that's the common thread rather than YouTube or Vimeo or whatever the, the hosting platform is. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. You're trying to actually, you know, you know, build a channel out of that stuff. And, uh, you know, it's kind of ties in because, you know, your, your first project was white ninja. Um, and that was, based mm-hmm. off, that was based off a web comic, you know, but again, it's, it's kind of like the similar idea, you know, they went out, they put something out there and they were finally, you know, they were able to develop it. And, you know, then all of a sudden now it's, it's a, it's a web series or a TV show. I mean, yeah. I, yeah, White Ninja is, was such a cool project. I mean, that webcomic was Web 1.0. It was so, so early on, um, and it was an idea that a friend of mine had had to turn it into a digital series when that was kind of – everybody was chasing digital, and they were chasing um, you, any kind of platform, Snapchat series. We were We were working with – vine and before that was defunct and just thought that that platform lent itself so beautifully to this resurgence of the of the comic strip you know what does a comic strip looks like look like outside of the sunday papers and in this digital world and thought that these six second kind of loops were the perfect place to um i guess rebirth the um the comic strip. So it was cool for a minute. And then in, as soon as we finished season one, Vine shut down and we were like, Oh shit. Okay. Well, um, where are we going to put this now? <laughs> yeah. I, I remember Vine. Um, but I know what you mean. Like there, there's always, you know, in all those social media channels, there's always seems to be something that's kind of, um, almost like intuitive to that. You know what I mean? Like a, con- a piece of content that's intuitive to, that type of channel, like just like Vine was to that. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was a cool experiment. Um, after season one, uh, I had already. I had been. I guess deep in with Bright Light, and that was uh, that was when I kind of left that show and went on to do just Bright Light things. So this the first season was really cool, and um, and it was interesting to develop for a completely different platform. I mean, we're doing it now for Jeffrey Katzenberg's Quibi. We're making a series. Um, and it is, it's very interesting. These new distribution models and these new ways that you can connect and, and, um, get your product out to consumers. Right, right. And then, you know, because you actually have another TV show that you're actually making right now, which is, uh, yes. you know, Julie and the Phantoms. Um, yeah. Do you actually want to do actually want to talk about that? I mean, because I actually uh, I, I I have it in front of me, but I'm actually interested to hear your your kind of uh, your, your your take on it. Yeah, I will. I can talk about it as much as I can talk about it. Um, it is based on a Brazilian television show. Um, it is uh, a Netflix original with music and dance and um, drama and comedy, and it's really fun and um, gorgeous show. Uh, executive produced and some of the episodes directed by a gentleman by the name of Kenny Ortega. And Kenny is like... Mr. Song and Dance. He's the dude when it comes to filmed musical uh, theater and and, um, musical on film. You know, somebody who worked with Gene Kelly and Donna Summer and Michael Jackson and directed Newsies and Hocus Pocus and all the high school musicals and Descendants franchises. And so he is um, an incredible creative leader. Um. And this project for me is more of a, you know, all the stuff that I've done to this point has been very um, independent and DIY. You know, even though Summer of 84 was, I mean, technically a studio movie with Gunpowder and Sky acting as the studio, um, it was still very much a small movie. It was, we had a lot of creative control over it. and We had a lot of fun making the film that we wanted to see, but... This for me is um, uh, 
a big learning experience. So, so when I, so you finally, so I mentioned Netflix and I was like, so I, I didn't even know this was going to be on Netflix. So that's a huge congrats, man. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah. I mean, it's a very, um, crazy time to be working with the company, you know, just seeing how they react to, um, seeing how they react to all of these other streamers and distribution platforms coming in. Um, it's been very cool to talk with my, our colleagues at Netflix. So, and interesting to work for a company that is so on the cutting edge, you know, treats their creatives with such, um, such reverence. It's, um, it's awesome. Yeah. It's a really great company. Yeah. Cause I mean, every creative, I mean, right now that's the, that's the goal is a Netflix series. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Um, it's cool. It's, it, and it was something that we are, I mean, Sean has done a couple of them, but I'd always wanted to work with them. And, um, we'd done a two seasons of a series called haters back off and a couple of movies for Netflix, but to actually get to do this, it's, um, it's cool. They're putting a lot of a lot of weight behind it because they see a lot of potential in Kenny's work. Obviously, he's created hits and made a lot of money for Disney, and Netflix wants a little bit of that, I think. And uh, haters back off. That was from uh, Miranda Sings, right? That was yeah. Now I wasn't. I didn't work on that, but it was a it was a bright light show. Yeah. Oh, okay. You know, I actually enjoyed that. Um, I I actually thought that that was because a friend of mine was a big fan of Miranda Sings, the YouTube series. And then he, I, yeah. he, I, I started watching the uh, Netflix show. Of, and I, I actually think they hit the groove pretty well with that. It was very offbeat for sure. I thought oh, it was, yeah. ve- but you know, she has a, a super specific type of comedy and um, that really clicks with, a, with a lot of people. And so I think she, it was, it was a really fun series, but uh, um and we got to make two seasons of it, yeah. Yeah, I I think the uncle and I forget what the actor's name is, but he he was kind of like the the more traditional comedy sense. That's why you know I I think that's why when Miranda had her quirky sense of comedy, I think that's why that's why they complemented each other well. Uh, particularly that the pilot episode I thought was really well done too. Um, you know, just shooting a commercial in a pet store, like shooting that yes. pilot in a, in a you yeah. Know, I just thought that was really funny. Yeah, it's very cool, man. She was awesome. Um, and it's actually crazy. Doing that show was apparently um, the hardest show to control from a security standpoint. Like her fans were crazier than Sean and the company had ever seen. Worked with, you know, everybody. Anne Hathaway and Robert Redford and... Um, Shia LaBeouf and um, Nicolas Cage and Samuel L. Jack, like he's worked with so many people and the heart, the, you know, the craziest fans that they'd ever seen was for her. It was kind of, uh, kind of funny. So, so basically they would just like find out where they were filming and just kind of like, they didn't want to leave until they met her or something like that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Sneaking her in and out of places and oh yeah, it was, uh, it was crazy. So you know, just speaking of uh, if you know crazy, you know, Jameson, what what is the hardest producing obstacle you've ever had to overcome? Uh, you know, as a question, I, I I always make sure to ask producers. You know, what is, what is that 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 biggest challenge that you've either had to 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 kind of figure out on set or or what have you? You know, what what was that? What was your biggest challenge? Hmm. Um. It's a good question, actually. I'm trying to think if I can point to anything. I mean, look, none, none of these problems that you have on set are life or death for the most part. They really shouldn't be. Like, we're not out here making, we're not out here saving lives. We're making filmed uh, entertainment for television and the movie theaters and the, some of the streamers, I guess, now. But um, so we don't have people's lives in our hands. So anytime that there's a, a big quote unquote crisis. It's always, we always try and remind ourselves, at least here at bright light that, um, it's not life or death to just take a minute, take a breath and we can figure it out. And if it can be solved with money, it's not really a problem. So I'm trying to pinpoint a cha- like a huge challenge. I think it's, it's mostly just people and making sure that, that everybody is, 
as happy as they can be. You know, you're working with 150, 200 people on set. There's always going to be problems and egos and, um, you know, things to solve. But um, I think it is really just navigating how you um, how you deal with people and how you deal with ego. Um, that's a, that's a daily challenge for sure to just kind of keep it as, um, mellow and, um, I guess calm as possible, you know, and, um, that's why, that's why we do this. We want to make, want to make movies and want to, uh, be on set and create something rather than being in the boardroom. So, um, those long hours and the, the tough challenges are, are a fine trade off. So, that, so, you know, a lot of this does come down to, you know, communication and, you know, kind of diffusing bad situations and stuff like that. Uh, you know, just having the different producers on here, that's kind of what I've, in, I've, you know, inferred from just interviewing, you know, different producers like yourself is uh, one, you have to be able to communicate to everybody. Um, mm-hmm. And most of the producers that I've had on here and most of the producers that I've met, um, everybody from, you know, um, you know, to producing stuff you see in the theater to producing, you know, indie films to producing whatever, um, that seems to be the, the big thing is also they want to be able to – a lot of them are more approachable, um, meaning on set they're approachable. Like if you want to come talk to them about something, um, they're pretty approachable but in that, in that way. Um, that's that's sort of what I've found is that it's communication, you know, being a people person. Um, I've only worked with a, with maybe two producers who don't want to talk to anybody ever for whatever reason. I don't know why, <laughs> but but they're just like, hey, everyone, stay away from me unless you're the director or or whatever. So you know, you know what I mean. It's most of them are, are pretty much have those two things in common. Yeah, I mean that's it. I think that that's that's a lot of this industry is communication and people skills, right? It doesn't matter if you are on set talking to a grip um, or if you are in development talking to a writer, you're always trying to get people on the same page and you as the producer are um, kind of the meeting spot for everything. The, the You're watching over the entire project from a 30,000 foot perspective. And so you are always trying to bring people into that same vision and, and keep them on track. Like I said, whether you are on set um, or whether you are in development, like it is always just dealing with people and how do you couch certain things? You know, how do you, um, how do you deal with one person versus the next? Cause not everybody responds to certain tactics. Well, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a people business for sure. It's a, and that's why, you know, that's why kind of to come full circle, it's, it's a trust business and it's hard to break into people hire the same people again and again and again, because they have great working relationships with them and they speak a common language and they know, you know, in, high stress, um, scenarios, they can count on this person. Um, and they can count on them time and time again. So be, you know, yeah, that I, I found that out too, you know, just, just working with the same people over and over again. There's a reason why directors, producers, et cetera, do that stuff. It's just because, yeah. you know, they've built a relationship. It's trust. Um, you know, I, I just, you know, when I do, um, different things. It's like, you know, sometimes you want to work with a different director of cinematography and then all of a sudden you realize, ah, this wasn't such a good idea. Uh, so, you know, yeah. it, it, it just happens. I mean, I, I've been on a set before where, you know, the director of cinematography is just not cooperative and just wants to be off on his own and doesn't want to talk to anybody. And you're like, oh, okay. Uh, I don't know how this is going to work, but, um, but you know, it's stuff like that. That's why you know about the biggest obstacle. That 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 question. I always again. I just to reiterate. I always ask that to producers, just because you see the gamut of you know you show up to a location and it's not you know maybe it's not ready or something's different. Uh, you know your director of cinematography doesn't want to show up, or you have somebody show up and they want to you know they want to ask for more money the day of. Um, by the way, all those things I mentioned have happened to me in one way or another. <laughs> it's uh, it's a very challenging role to be in and that you're juggling so many different things and there's so much going on that there are bound to be crazy problems. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you, so, you know, Jameson, you know, we've been talking for, you know, just about 45 minutes. Um, you know, just to just to kind of put a period at the end of all this, you know, is there anything that we can get a chance to discuss that you wanted to discuss right now or anything, anything at all? Um, no, nothing that comes to mind. I mean, uh, it's so great. It's so fun to talk to people about the nuts and bolts of making independent cinema. Um, and it is a, it is an incredible it, a passion of mine. I love, I do love working in TV and I'm having an, an, a phenomenal experience with this show, but there is something so satisfying about, um, kind of knuckling down and, uh, and making independent film, um, that I love. So I'm excited. I've got one in the, in the pipe for June, July next year that we'll shoot, uh, here in Vancouver, it looks like. And, um, I'm excited to, to kind of get back to those independent roots while I'm in between some of these more studio gigs. You know, and that's really cool. And and, you know, whenever, Never, if you ever want to come back on, Jameson, you know when when any of these projects come out, uh, please let me know, and uh, I'd be glad to have you come back on. Oh, I appreciate it, man. This has actually been a, a really great experience. You were right at the top when you're like, I haven't had a bad time yet. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is this is great. Kind of no holds barred conversation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and you know, I, I'm glad you had a good time. Uh, and, and where can people find you out online? Do you have any social media channels or any websites you want to give out? Yeah, I mean, I'm. Uh, brightlightpictures.com is where we're putting up everything that we do. Um, I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram, but I, I keep Instagram kind of just for me. Um, so Twitter and, and, uh, and bright light pictures is where I usually am. And like you, um, did before this, my IMDB is where it has all the stuff that we're currently, I'm currently working on and stuff that's coming up. And, um, that's a great place to to find out what what we have at, at Bright Light and what I got going on here too. And uh, everyone, I'm going to link to all that in the show notes at DaveBullsPodcast dot com. Um, you know, it, it's kind of funny. I got deal. I, I got uh, in trouble with YouTube, and I got in trouble with like Apple. You know, I, I, I am this close, Jameson, just being erased from the internet completely. So <laughs> I just, I just keep pissing off these giant internet corporations, uh, and I don't even. I'm not even trying to do anything. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> I, I got in trouble with Facebook over over posting a, a, this podcast, and I'm like, all right, well, I'm batting a thousand. So. Uh, <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm, it's like it's like I've done. The, I've, I'm just I'm this close away from just pissing off every internet giant, and uh, <laughs> and, then, and then I won't be able to do anything. Um, but, uh, the gatekeepers, yeah. yeah. So seriously, my God, uh, I haven't pissed off Verizon or Comcast yet, so I, I need to work on that. So, um, but, right. <laughs> but uh, it's, the, it's still the beginning of the week. You got time? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, see what I can do this week. Uh, but everyone, it's it's uh, Dave Bull's podcast. I have all my social media channels on there. I have every episode of the podcast on there as well. Uh, and again, thank you for everyone who always keeps sharing this podcast. And Jameson, I want to say thank you so much for coming on. And this has been a, a blast. Thank you so much for having me, man. Really excited to uh, listen, keep listening to your podcast and, and hopefully be on it again in the future. Find Dave at DaveBullis.com. Please make sure to subscribe and share the podcast.